As electronics components shrink, heat management becomes more and more of an issue. Unwanted heat in electronics can compromise the performance and shorten product life. Using infrared thermography in the design phase of an electronic design has been around for decades. The relationship between heat and electrical resistance make identifying shorts and faults a straightforward exercise. Being able to visualize heat patterns across devices can validate software-generated thermal models. In many instances, infrared thermography will naturally evolve from an R&D tool in the development stage to a quality assurance tool in the manufacturing stage. In this episode of the Thermal Review, we discuss how thermal imaging can aid in the development and manufacturing stages of microelectronics. Good day, Marcus. Hello, Dave. Hello. <laughs> this, this, this episode is, is actually a continuation of episode six where we talk about microelectronics. The difference today is that we have a special guest with us. We have uh, Mr. Ross Overstreet, who, uh, well, we've known Ross for years. You've Many known years. him longer than I have. Yeah. Half my life. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. He's essentially the reason for the for the birth of Mobiterm, in a way. Boy, that's an interesting story. We should probably so real quick, Ross. Ross, by the way, he's he's the director of, of sales for the science and R and D group at Teledyne Fleer. Uh, Ross and I worked together uh, for many years at Fleer Systems in the science space. And, and and Marcus, maybe you guys can tell the story just real quick of how you and Marcus, or I guess Marcus, how you and Ross know each other, and how Mark Ross influenced the <laughs> the, the start of Mobiter. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I'll get through that eventually. Do you want to kick that off? Uh, yeah. So, a little bit about my background. Uh, I've got a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering at Auburn University. I moved out here to California working for Boeing as a test engineer, testing parts for the space station. Uh, then, after doing that for a while, I got recruited by my local National Instruments sales guy. He thought that maybe I'd be good at his sort of job. And I loved lab view and measurement and data acquisition. It seemed like a cool thing. So I moved over to National Instruments and I was selling test and measurement equipment. And a lot of people need help uh, creating their own measurement systems. Maybe they don't quite have the software expertise or they need special hardware built. So we would rely on system integrators uh, to help some of our key customers out. And I got to meet Marcus. I think I met you in my first couple of weeks of working for National Instruments. Yeah, I actually worked with your predecessor over Ted, there, yeah. Ted Crancher. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I had just started my business, and I was going into the you know automation world as a single man consultant, and and I had to realize that I had to like partner up with some bigger outfit to kind of get the word out there and get some business pushed my way and referred to me and, and I, I bundled up with, with Dash Instruments, got through certifications with LabVIEW and all those kind of things. And then up in LA, that was, uh, Ross came along and he was my new designated uh, salesperson. So that was 22 <laughs> years ago. And when did you, because you were working for National Instruments and then we actually recruited Ross over to FLIR Systems. What year was that? Uh, uh, almost 17 years ago now. Almost 17 years yeah. ago, wow. Yeah. And at FLIR Systems, and we've talked about this before, FLIR makes amazing infrared camera systems. Uh, and of course, you and I work in the, uh, the science space, but they, they also have an automation line as well. Very good at making sensors, but when it comes to, well, as you talked about integration, so maybe yeah, we pick up from there and talk about how this helped in the evolution of MobiTherm. So just like National Instruments, FLIR has historically been a tools provider and not a systems integrator. So we rely on the end user uh, to take the tool and apply it in the best way to solve their problem or learn what they're trying to learn or uh, bake it into their process. And some customers are very adept at that and have a lot of on-site expertise, uh, but others don't. They need a little bit of help. So you know, that's where we relied on integrators. And when I moved over to FLIR, I saw there was that same need that we had at National Instruments for integrators existed at FLIR as well. So I told Marcus, hey, you know, what do you think about infrared cameras? And he spent much time working with those. And he actually had some familiarity with it and understood the problem and uh, quickly took off in that direction. And yeah, that's a bigger part of your business now than uh, what you're originally doing, right? Yeah, totally unexpected direction. But um, <clears throat> I, I guess there, there weren't many companies out there at the time that would actually do uh, apply image processing to, to thermal imaging in an automated fashion, right? There was always the, the tools from FLIR that was like a desktop software you could poke around with your mouse and like, how hot is this? What's the temperature here? 
but there wasn't really anything there in uh, on the manufacturing floor. And partially, I think this was also a, a it was very early stage. The the machine vision industry at that time wasn't very standardized. There weren't really many standard interfaces. There weren't any standard communication protocols like Genicam, Gigi Vision, all those kind of things didn't really exist back then. So the integration of these cameras was really difficult at the time because everybody was doing their yeah. homebrew communications interface. The documentation wasn't really there. But also the, the, the cost of the cameras back then was just, even for uncooled cameras. I mean, nowadays you can buy something for like a thousand dollars. Back then we were like at 40, 45,000 for, for the cheapest camera. So there weren't that many business cases out there to, to put something like that uh, at the end of the line in, in, in a quality application, because like you add the software development on top of that and all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a 70, 80, $90,000 solution for a problem that may be just $25,000 or something. And so we wouldn't get the traction. So we would really just focus on really specialty applications with, with, with a lot of return on investment for some expensive problems at first. And later on, as the prices came down, we would uh, kind of get more and more traction over time. And that's where movie Clear really brought a value to, to us at Clear because uh, uh, again, we could provide the sensor, but we knew we needed someone who could wrap the solution around it, right? Or complete the solution because the customers would have a, a problem that they, they needed to solve and the camera in and of itself wouldn't do that. They needed what you talked about, the software and maybe even some hardware around it. We have a, actually an example here, maybe we'll talk about at some point in time of, of, of how uh, MobiTherm is creating solutions around these cameras that Ross and his team uh, at Fleer Systems are you know, manufacturing, developing, and selling to the market. That's crazy history. I kind of, I, I didn't really even think about that, but yeah, right. Ross, you were very instrumental in, in the development or the introduction which led to uh, where we are today. Maybe introduction. I can't take much credit there. Uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, so anyways, it's great to have you here. Uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, on, on our podcast, the, the Thermal Review, where really we're all about just trying to spread the, the, the word of thermal imaging and uh, infrared camera technologies and how it can be utilized to solve various various problems that you know industry markets r and d may have and so much is changing right now i'm really glad you guys are doing this so you can you know help spread the word about uh, things that are getting easier or better or lower cost and enabling this technology to be used in places that couldn't be considered even five years ago yeah well i i, I joke around with marcus all the time saying this is like the newest old technology because it's been in, it's been around for 50 plus years right, right? But I mean, and, and I guess Ross, this is this is where I want to ask uh, you this question because it has been around for so long. But as you just mentioned, there's been so many changes uh, to the technology, uh, not just the hardware itself, but also price points and and just availability. I, I mean, what are what are some of the big trends that you see right now? And I know we're. We're, 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 we're talking about microelectronics, but maybe just in general as well. What are you seeing out there? Yeah, well, the really exciting thing for us is uh, you know, there are two general types of cameras, the uncooled microbolometers and the high-performance cooled cameras. The price point on the uncooled microbolometers has, got, has really dropped in the last uh, three or four years. Um, it took maybe $20,000 to get a capable system five years ago, and now you can do that for you know, almost half that price. Uh, the cameras have gotten a lot smaller, uh, so you can fit them into applications that had maybe had size constraints before. Yeah. Um, the software has gotten a, a lot easier to use. Uh, connectivity is easy. At one point, it was a science fair project to hook everything up and get an image. Oh my uh, gosh. Now our software is super easy, and Marcus mentioned the standards have been developed uh, for standardized ways of talking to the camera and getting the data back or having the camera make decisions and send those out to various parts of your control system. Right, yeah, what I mentioned earlier, Genicam, Gigi Vision is now totally prevalent on these things, so that makes it uh, easy for us to integrate. It makes it also easy for the customer to maintain. Even if a, if a new camera comes on the market, it's, it's typically a relatively minor switchover. Uh, there may be a small little software tweak, a little patch that needs to go out, but for the, for the majority of, of the cameras, you can just swap them. I can even test out a, a cooled high-performance camera in, in comparison to an uncooled microbolometer and can quickly demonstrate the differences and the advantages of, of doing that sort of thing. So it really has opened up, you know, the, the ability for us to, to use those tools. With the same basic software, right. without a lot of changes. Right. Yeah. Um, on the high-end front, something that's exciting is the uh, lensing has gotten a lot better in the last few years. 
Uh, we just released a 50 millimeter macro lens. And Marcus, you had something to do with that because you had an early customer right. that really had a requirement that it, multiple customers were asking for it, but it was a hot requirement to help drive this. Yeah, maybe backing up a little bit for our listeners because that's something when our customers are, some of them are familiar with the machine vision world. And it's very common when you take traditional machine vision cameras, daylight cameras, smart cameras, that you buy typically a camera from a manufacturer. And then you have a an enormous amount of selection in terms of lenses from all kinds of third parties. And for any conceivable, I mean, there's 500 plus different lens choices available for any given camera out there. Lenses are never an issue. When we enter the thermography world, it's different. Typically, the, the manufacturers of these cameras, such as Teledyne Flare, manufacture their own uh, lenses because they have to be calibrated, temperature calibrated to the camera. So you can't just buy some off the shelf lens and then put it on a camera and then hope it works because it won't because it's not in calibration and you know image correction issues and those kind of things. So with that comes a very limited pool of availabilities. So now we have to be a lot more thoughtful when, when you look at uh, you know field of view sizes and, and resolution, pixel resolution, you're now limited to maybe three to five lens choices, possibly a little more. And, and that um, has to be carefully crafted to, to make sure that you're really maximizing your investment in these cameras, that we have a lot of, you know, enough pixels on target and, and coming back to that macro lens, um, they were like, you know, 1X and 3X sort of magnification, primary magnification, microscopic lens attachments available. But often we have things where we're like, okay, we're right in between, where right. this, the mm -hmm. highest magnification is too small of a field of view and the lowest magnification is too large, you're wasting too many pixels. What if you need something in between? And then that lens came in where we can actually adjust. It's basically a manual uh, zoom lens, if you will. Um, we can, um, it's a very focal lens. We can actually uh, you know, change that and really optimize it exactly to what you need. and and. I guess the only answer beforehand was, uh, I call it the, the poor man's microscope, when, when you actually use extender Some rings, which are just spacers in between the lens to change the back focal distance and therefore the magnification and field of view size, but it's it's not as optimized. There's as some it, compromises to be made with right. extender rings, and this gets around right. all of that. This yeah. is the perfect fit between a 50 millimeter <clears throat> at its minimum focus and the 1X microscope, and it's really being adopted in the electronics industry right now because it just works out a lot of the fields of views are smaller. Right, you know, people are working on smaller devices, or they're trying to see individual ASICs, mm. and it's an, and, it's and beautiful, really beautiful imagery from that lens. And it sounds like you, you maintain the uh, the calibration integrity with this lens. Ab absolutely, that's that's yeah. amazing. We maintain temperature accuracy, and we also have some additional higher performance microscope lenses that are going to be released soon. I can't talk about them too much right now because it's a, a pre-release product. I'd love to. I want to. And I'm super excited to get my hands on them. Outstanding, Ross. Um, what other changes? You mentioned the technology, the cooled, uncooled lensing prices. Anything else? You have, well, you also mentioned software. Yeah, so it's our software. Uh, we're Fleer Research Studio is our latest software. It's super easy to use. It's multi-platform, so it runs on Windows, Linux, or Mac. Um, mm -hmm. You can connect multiple cameras to a single instance of the software. You can look at a camera and a data file at the same time. Uh, it's under heavy active development, we have a team of software developers that are making improvements constantly. We have a major revision roughly once a year. Um, it's just, it's the nicest software on the market for R&D applications and it's just improving uh, every year. You know, I had a flashback. I don't know if this number means anything to you. 1422. If I put an NI in front of that, does that mean anything to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, when you were talking about AVDS. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I had this flashback of how we, we used to connect to these science grade cameras with a National Instruments, you know, 1422 trade yeah. card. And, and, and that was before we had the, the standards yeah. and what an exercise that was. So to come from that to where we are today, and, and I have played with the, the, the Research Studio software. In fact, just last week, I was utilizing it to capture some imagery that we're utilizing in some educational videos that we're putting together. It, it, it was brilliant. It was so easy to use. And I could have multiple windows running at one time, uh, you know, looking at different camera playbacks and making yeah. adjustments and then deciding, okay, which images do I want to save or, or, or sequence of images or infrared videos, if you will, 
it's just so easy because everything is Ethernet connection to the camera or USB connection to the camera. So no frame. You can still use frame grabbers if you really need to for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, you don't have to worry about that. You can just have a you know, common cable connection to the camera. Yeah. Get to an image within two or three minutes of unboxing everything. And even for automation applications, a lot of times customers will start with one of my R&D type cameras with my software to do a proof of concept see if they can actually identify the, the problem or condition that they're looking for. If they can, then they figure out how to automate it, either developing a system themselves or working with MovieDerm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what, I'd like to talk about that a little bit because there seems to be, yeah, this natural evolution, if you will, as I call it, where usually, uh, you know, thermography may be utilized or, or infrared camera technology may be utilized in an R&D stage. Let's talk about that stage for just a little bit. Um, and we did in our last episode, but maybe Ross, since we have you here with us today, what are what are some of the things, or, or how are you how are you seeing uh, infrared being utilized in that stage, uh, the development process, the R and D stage in 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 microelectronics? You know, really on both ends of the spectrum. Sometimes you just need to find a hot spot on a board somewhere, and you can use a low cost uncooled microblown, or even one of our handheld cameras to do that. Um, I was in a demo in Arizona where I was looking at cruise missile power supplies. And these things have to be small and lightweight, and they don't need long run times. If it's a 100 or 1,000 hour MTBF, yeah. that's considered fine. So the designers were able to bend the rules a little bit, and they were able to run components hotter than you would normally run them. So they just need to look around in their device. It was a little cube with multiple boards stacked and see if anything in there was exceeding the, the design limits, or, which were well above what you would normally do for, say, consumer electronics. And they had a certain area in mind. We were looking at that area, and I noticed there was another component on the other side of the board that was significantly hotter than anything else. And it's not an area they were concerned about. They didn't realize it was getting that hot. And they, it was like 200 degrees C. It was just yeah, about to smoke. It was really hot. It was ready to smoke. And they were like, that thing's going to fail in a matter of minutes to hours. It's, there's no way this product is going to survive with the component at that temperature. Yeah. Um, so every, you know, the demo stops, the designers all come around, everybody gathers around. It's always the, the fun part mm -hmm. of the demo. Yeah. So you've got the low end where you're just looking for a hot spot or an anomaly, and it's a gross thing, it's easy to see. And you've got the other side of it where uh, companies are building more of their own silicon, and they're creating more ASICs in-house and more systems on a chip type things where they just need one chip that has a lot of functionality in there instead of having a bunch of discrete components that are talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. and Power consumption is a really big deal. And sometimes they just need to see where in this chip uh, things are getting warm or power is being dissipated. Um, and you typically have to do this in the design stage, R&D stage, before it's encapsulated. After it's encapsulated, you have plastic or some package on top of it that spreads the heat out, it's tougher to see. Uh, recently I was at a demo uh, and this company makes implantable defibrillators. And they have a battery and it lasts for a number of years. I, I don't remember the spec, but it was probably you know, five or eight years or something like that. And then eventually the, the battery runs out and the thing has to be replaced. And they had a chip that sometimes would draw more power than it should. And electrically, they could identify this, they could measure it using electrical test equipment. Right. Right. And it's all tiny. It was like you know, a bad chip would consume 20 microamps and a good one would consume five microamps or something like that. It was a tiny, tiny difference. Uh, we were able to use the new lens that I talked about yeah. and look at one of these. And it actually was encapsulated. It was a, a finished product. It didn't have the clamshell on it, but it was the board uh, that would you know, be in the device. And we could actually see on this ASIC where these hot spots were. Yeah. And given that information, they were able to go look at the schematic and know what sections of that chip uh, was related to that function and you know, trace it down. Yeah, yeah. And it, there's been example after example where just seeing a tiny warm spot in an ASIC provided designers information that they otherwise had no way of gathering. Right, yeah, we had a similar example where we had a, um, like a forensic analysis of, of chips failing and they were they were decapping chips. And that's the method of, for, for those guys who don't know, uh, is basically taking the, the, the package apart where the dye is exposed, right? So we can actually look directly at the dye. And then they would do functional uh, lock-in thermography on it and pinpoint um, there were some diodes on the chip and there was actually a radiation hardened chip and then those chips go basically into space on satellites and those kind of things and they're really really expensive because they uh, they have to go every single chip has to go through rigorous testing 
So it's not just the manufacture of the chip, but it's actually the testing procedures that they have to run through um, just drive the chip cost up. I mean, 50 to $100,000 per chip is not unheard of for, for something like that. And if these fail, that's obviously, I mean, if you have it in space and your satellite fails, it's not a pretty situation, right? Yeah, plus your alternatives for repair are right? <laughs> somewhat limited. Yeah, so um, we were actually providing one of our systems that we see here in the background to, um, to actually look at that. Um, and actually look at the die and see also some hotspots on there. And that was unexpected. Um, it was not unexpected that it would get warm, but the level of, of uh, heating was unexpected. We could really pinpoint it uh, actually on the microstructure, on the chip, and they, the designer knew ex instantly what all he's like. What was causing it. Yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. 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 So I love it when the demo stops and they have to go get other people and they start breaking out masks because yeah. you know you provide meaningful data and this is going to go somewhere with that. Right, right. right. Yeah. That, gosh, one of the... We talk about this often, one of the beauties of infrared or thermal imaging or thermography, where you're assessing the condition or health of a you know, process or a target with this technology, is that it's both qualitative, but also and, and quantitative. But that qualitative is because you get that thermal image. Sure. Right? Yeah. That is just so, it, it's very easy to interpret. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you have a color scale or a gray scale that's also on the image, you can you can somewhat deduce, you know, what the temperatures are just visually without even doing any more quantitative work with it. Yeah, it really gives you superpowers. Yeah, it, it yeah, it's does. Like, it's yeah. kind of like this predator view, right? Because you, you can make a different wavelength visible and then you have that extra sim, that sixth sense, basically, for the photo. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, Marcus, you mentioned this setup here. Why, why don't we... It, this is... this. So when I think of Ross talking about a system, and I know this because I used to work in this space, we would, we would show up and demo with, what, like a tripod? Or a bench clamp, a whole or a cart full of gear, a, yeah, a, a <laughs> yeah. ton of gear, wheeling it in, setting it up on a bench yeah. top, uh, usually a computer, and 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 we would essentially have our own little makeshift, you know, uh, demo setup or or bench top uh, solution that we would carry with us. This is kind of taking it to the next level, right? Developing a a, right. a, a, a ready out of box solution for a customer to start using right away and. Uh, maybe you can describe Rod. I mean, this is this is your FLIR cool camera, right? Yeah. 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 Maybe you can see that kind of describe. Right. Know, so we, we, we put here. all of this into this uh, extruded aluminum framing, and, and what we have is a complete system solution. This is basically a, a microscopic lock-in thermography system. Um, and uh, what this is, we have a we have a cooled camera there with a one X lens. There we have a, a, an LED light source for excitation. We have it on a vertical column with a, uh, a little adjustment uh, linear slide that we can change the, the working distance of the camera home. And then we have this workspace where we can put samples on there. And um, essentially down here, we have a you know industrial PC, we have a programmable power supply, we have some synchronization electronics in there and some power management and controllers and, sort of, and, and a data acquisition system all kind of integrated into one unit. And what this allows the customer then to do, this is going to get enclosed further, but this is just left open for now. But um, they can essentially put their uh, sample parts there and, and perform testing. Uh, and, and really just uh, once they have it dialed in, they literally just press a button uh, on, on their mouse and just perform testing on yeah. it. And then they can uh, export reports and everything else. So it's, it's really, you know, geared towards, um, you know, R&D, uh, improving issues improving efficiencies on their microelectronics and everything else and it's, it's becoming a, a great addition we see this often being purchased by groups that have a failure analysis lab or yeah. in the r d space where folks um, take this in as yet another tool i mean they, they you go into those fa labs those failure analysis labs i mean they have just every toy under the sun right they have a ct uh, thing x-ray they have like pretty much everything out there and they're trying to throw any possible sensing technology at their problems. Yeah. Because that's they need to solve these problems, right? They need to measure what's going on and prove it. And, yeah. So maybe you can describe it at a very basic level for those of you know our listeners, what is failure analysis? So when you design a product, um, you know, you, you perform quality assurance testing, anything you can dream up, it says like what what constitutes a good um, part essentially you have certain criteria that you design for and now you're trying to prove it with testing that um, the specification that you put later on that everybody can see that on a specification sheet are being met right yeah. under certain conditions operating conditions this could be temperature variations humidity variations vibration all those kind of things are being tested 
just to make sure that yes, what we promise on the spec sheet is being met, right? So that folks that design these products in can rely on, okay, if I design this into this chip or whatever else, or this piece of electronic, whatever it is, into something larger that I can rely on that it holds up to specifications. What, and then you also do you know, the stress testing and accelerated aging and all this kind of things. But no matter how much testing you do, I mean, you have a limited scope in what you can do. And then um, you sell it to thousands of customers and they put it in environments that are just unexpected. Mm -hmm. And stuff starts to fail. No, no piece of electronic is, is without failure rate. There are some folks, I mean, some, some piece of electronics that just start to fail. Now, if that's a very small percentile, that's just the way it is because you have manufacturing defects on, on, on your microelectronics, on your dyes, you know, on your wafers, whatever it is, yeah. impurities. You may have had an accidental uh, static discharge that, that created some you know, atomic differences on the, on, on the wafer or whatever it may be. So that later on uh, relates into uh, you know, a shortened life time and you just can't easily test for those things. So that's expected, but the issue starts when you have failures that are abnormally high and, and, and you, you percentage of expected failures that's normal is being breached and you're like, uh, okay, now we have a problem. So then typically these companies have these parts shipped back to them and then they're like, okay, what happened? And they want to find out the root cause. And mm -hmm. that's where these failure analysis labs come in and says, okay, it's basically the Sherlock Holmes of the company that basically goes in now and works with the R&D department and goes in and goes to town and like, that's fine. Um, you know, it's kind of like the CSI show, let's, let's find the forensics here that lead that give us the clue why it failed right and sure. that's where they throw all of these nice toys what we call them as engineers that we all get giddy about um <laughs> you know and, and and they try to throw anything conceivable at it to find the root cause of this thing so that they can hopefully work towards it to fixing it so that the next batch that shipped out is not going to have the same symptoms as, as the first batch that failed kind of thing. so that's kind of in a nutshell what what these fa labs what we call them are and, and again, a lot of them um, have an interest in, in thermography, um, you know, and, and uh, microscopic thermography and, and locket thermography. Those are all good tools uh, because again, heat is typically omnipresent and it's um, it is expected, it's sometimes desired and sometimes it's not so desirable depending on what magnitude it's at, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent, thank you. Great, great explanation, uh, uh, description of what that is. I'm, so we've talked a little about R&D, and design phase, a little bit about failure analysis. I'm curious, uh, Ross, what what might uh, uh, you know a, a a quality assurance or automation type application or setting look like utilizing thermography? How how or maybe how is that different from R and D and failure analysis? Well, backing up to this system for a moment, one thing that really strikes me about this is how uh, configurable it is and how easy it would be to move the camera to a different height or even build a, a platform with a bigger base. Um, just fixturing, just getting a camera above a part in the right location is mm -hmm. a giant challenge. And you'd be amazed at the number of companies that just struggle with how to hold the camera above the part. So yeah. having a configurable solution like this where you can quickly make changes um, is right. being really powerful. Uh, moving to the automation space, um, you've got the, the easy, the automotive world's been big on my mind lately because we we're seeing what's happening with you know, Tesla and Rivian and, and all the various automotive startups are really cranking out vehicles right now. Um, battery test is a big thing and uh, obviously the, the battery pack is really the heart of the vehicle and the part that's probably most prone to failure at this point. And microelectronics are well understood and figured out that yeah. large battery packs are a relatively new technology for us. And everybody's testing their battery packs a different way, but some of these companies, most of these companies are using thermography in one way or another. Um, and if you can detect a problem with the battery pack during the build phase and not have to do that recall, yeah. it mm -hmm. can make a giant difference in your bottom line. Right, right. Yeah, I can totally uh, uh, you know, reflect on that. Um, we definitely have a lot of uh, you know, battery sort of topics and, and, and what we do uh, as well from, from the battery welding to, to other things. But there's also another thing in the EV market is also the power electronics that actually drive the motors um, because they get smaller and smaller. The more you cram the stuff in, you still have to deliver the power, right? Yeah. And um, you, you have these power switchers, if you call them, those are transistors that are basically delivering the power to, to the electric motors. Um, they're getting, I mean, 
really small, but they have to deliver. Like if you like if you Tesla, you're stepping. Anybody has ever driven a Tesla or in a Tesla? I mean, you step on the gas. How fast that accelerates? Such new cars. Yeah, just absolutely mind-boggling. But that power has to be delivered from the battery pack to the drive system to the motors, and and um, it is such a large currents that are flowing there. So in terms of heat, I mean, the, the slightest bit, anybody that has electronics background <laughs> can appreciate um, when, when you switch a transistor, you have to make sure that you're switching from the total off state, from, from, from the high resistance to the low resistance, the fastest possible way. If you do this, and we're talking sometimes like, you know, nanoseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds sort of switching. If something goes wrong there, that that transistor literally explodes mm. on the circuit board because yeah. the heat develops so quickly that it just can't be heat sunk away that quickly and it just so that's very important to do um, you know those kind of things and we had a topic like this too where we looked at you know high speed analysis of, of uh, semiconductors exploding mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you remember we had I do remember this. <laughs> and, and, and there's actually um, specialty applications with lock and thermography where we can do high speed analysis with our thousand frames up and those kind of things to analyze where where would that semiconductor fail if it does fail so that tells them also there's something about the design of a semiconductor and how to attach the die to the heat sink and all those kind of things there's a lot of science behind all of that and 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 that's another sort of application where that kind yeah. of you know, goes in. in. In my career, I've seen some very interesting and unique applications for uh, imprint thermography uh, in, a, in a quality assurance phase uh, or in a production quality assurance phase. Um, believe it or not, electronic cigarettes. Uh, yeah. Was it, <laughs> you may remember that yeah. application, a very big application. Where yes. it's, this is something that you do not want going off or overheating. I mean, when you consider how it's Utilize right. Uh, right you, know, sure. you don't want some, something blowing up in somebody's face. Uh, so uh, uh, there were companies utilizing thermography to evaluate or do quality assurance on these e-cigarettes uh, to make sure they were within spec before they would right. go to market. Um, another interesting application I remember seeing at one point in time was by an LCD uh, monitor yep. manufacturer where they're actually uh, looking at the monitors, uh, looking for any shorts or defects yeah. in, in a QA. Capability. Th th those are just some of the things that I that I remember straight. Right. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything that jumps out in your mind. LED, that... LEDs is is one of those things too because it, you know there, there was a time where, where traffic lights were still um, you know just regular incandescent light bulbs, right? And nowadays they're all almost exclusively LED. But the problem was I've, I've seen especially in the beginning mm. you would see this whole light cluster of LEDs and they started to flicker and fail left and right because they they had to learn their lesson that the, these LEDs inside that that black canister they get so hot, you yeah. know, and and they're pretty bright, so they 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 already creating a lot of heat on their on their own. So they were all miscalculating the, the the thermal management that they had to do there to to keep them alive. You know, nowadays I don't see that anymore, so they they have definitely improved on this thing. But those are things, and also where LEDs now replacing pretty much the the fluorescent. Everything is LEDs, and yeah. from stage lighting to this to that. And um, you know, thermal is thermal management is the, the key thing in anything electronics. Otherwise, it, it, most electronics die because of, of improper thermal management. You know, they just get too warm, and then they just can't handle it, and they just you know, <laughs> they just give up. You know? Yeah, yeah. How, how about you, Ross? I guess hit the big applications. I mean, we've sold lots of cameras to every one of the LED manufacturers. Mm. Uh, they're all using our cameras, the e-cigarette thing. Uh, a lot of medical devices, um, yeah. you know, weight loss devices that heat fat up and weight loss devices that chill fat down and uh, <laughs> sur surgery devices where the instruments have to be at a certain temperature to make things happen. Yeah. Machinery that pulls fluids out of you and works on them and they have to keep those fluids at a certain temperature. Just everything temperature related. Probably the reason I've been in infrared so long is the applications are so diverse. In yeah. the same week I could literally look at a lab rat and a rocket. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was I was thinking the same thing. That's what makes this business that we're in so so exciting. So yeah, it's, fun it's, it's like it's new. It's like the, it's like the show how it's made for us like every day. Like we go into manufacturing companies and yeah. we get to learn how is this made, and yeah. then they're showing us all the issues, and we're just looking at it from a 
perspective of where can thermal imaging fit in here and sure. help them out on this thing, right? Yeah. That's our secret. I mean, we have to sell cameras and close business where they keep paying the rent, keep the lights on. But really, it's a big lab tour. We get to learn about processes and see yeah. how things are done. And occasionally, help somebody solve a really hard problem. It just makes their job easier. And right. I love seeing you know faces light up and problems that they've tried six different ways to solve. Yeah. And the IR technology just makes it easy. Yeah. Well, wow, so that's a great in, uh, lead into the next question that I wanted to run by you and Marcus, and that is, if someone out there, one of our listeners, or someone's looking at wanting to utilize this technology, and let's say it was for electronics, or maybe not, uh, I mean, what what words of advice uh, would, you, would you give to them? Uh, reach out to an expert and uh, talk to us about the best options, and don't just randomly pick something uh, that you find on the internet or just guess at a model number. Um, our website it sometimes isn't the easiest to navigate just because Teledyne Fleer is such a giant company and it sells so many different types of cameras it can be tough to find your way if you're new to infrared. Um, and if you're trying to solve a problem that I'm almost certain that Marcus has seen it before, I've seen it before, you've seen it before, uh, we can just save them lots of time and it doesn't cost anything for a phone consultation or a Zoom call or something like that. Right. Yeah. We can also help calibrate you a little bit on how difficult the problem truly is and what sort of budget you should be looking at. I mean, sometimes people are working on $80,000 problems and they have $10,000 of budget and there's a mismatch and we have to say, you just can't solve that problem for $5,000. It just, right. you know, the, the technology isn't there right now. And then other times they're looking at a really expensive camera and I go, yeah, it's kind of an easy problem. I can solve that with a really low cost hand. Right. The common misconception that I come across uh, quite often is like people just buying a camera because they for some reason think that's the right tool and trying to um, you know integrate it themselves have, have never done it before it's like the, the fearless engineers right yeah. and then they go in there and then and then they're realizing because everybody that enters this world of thermal imaging has to go through this learning curve and there's reasons why there's week-long certification courses and learning sure. and this and that right and that's just overcoming the initial learning curve. This has nothing to do with even gaining experience yet, right? Yeah. And then I see people struggle and struggle with with problems that are just second nature to us. And we're like, yeah, one sentence from us could have saved you a few weeks here because you just, you know, just just like Ross said, talk to us because it's like, you know, you know, use our experience to your advantage. You know what I mean? Like, like there's something to be said about somebody that past 20 plus years experience in the field, you know, that that's that should not be underestimated. It's not something you can shortcut. And it's kind of rare that you can get access to an expert with a couple of decades of experience for free. Right. You, you can't go to the doctor for free. You can't go to the mechanic for free when, you, yeah. when your car is doing something significant. But you can talk to one of us, phone call or Zoom call, and right. we can really help steer you in the right direction. Exactly. That's such a, a such great words of advice. Um, I've had the unfortunate uh, instances where I've had the conversation with a customer that you may have, maybe Marcus as well, where you had to let that customer know who had already gone out on their own and purchased an infrared camera system to solve their problem, yeah. to let them know that they bought the it's wrong just not your camera. <laughs> right. And maybe they, they had a long wave infrared camera that they really needed mid wave, yeah. or vice versa, or they were utilizing a micro velometer on a high speed event and you had to break the news to them that you can't cheat physics yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and the physics uh, apply to the different types of cameras and lenses that are out there as well. So, oh my gosh, get that consultation up front. Right. Hollywood hasn't done us any favors. Uh, no, you see, very true. You see very things true. that are just wrong in movies all the time. <laughs> or no movies. offense, Hollywood. <laughs> Whether they're looking through walls or looking yeah. through heavy plastic and things that right. just optical physics don't allow. Thermal cameras, just for the record, cannot see through walls. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, yeah it's imaging camera. And That's another <laughs> podcast for another day. <laughs> yeah, and, and there, are, there are limitations on the temperature accuracy and there's certain parameters that you have to know about in order to get a good reading. You can't just arbitrarily point an infrared camera at any surface and expect to accurately measure its temperature. Yeah, I see that quite often too, where people think, okay, there's, there's a camera that can measure temperature and they mistake the camera for another thermometer, right? Mm -hmm. How hard can it be? 
holding a thermometer against something, what does it do? It tells you the temperature, right? Uh, and you think, okay, I'm having a handheld camera or, or fixed mount camera that measures temperature should should tell me the truth, right? But uh, there's so much more science behind that in physics that need to be understood in order to apply that tool properly. And if you don't understand that, uh, you've, you know, your surface properties and the physics behind it, you can be off by tens of degrees, you know, yeah. and it's just like, you know. That's really the problem with the improvements we've made with bringing the price point down. Because once upon a time, when cameras cost forty to one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, you had to be serious about a purchase. And typically, the person did a lot of research. Maybe it was a senior scientist at the company that got to use the equipment. But now that they're much lower cost, on par with a nice oscilloscope, just any any technician or a new employee uh, can really get their hands on these. Right. And without a little bit of training, it's the only thing worse than no data is bad data, and you can get bad data if you're not careful. Yeah. Right. And then often often customers draw the wrong conclusions, which yes. is frustrating to us because they're like, oh, no, we tried this, and they, they go through all these analysis and have great reports and everything else. And like, oh, yeah, no, thermography is not going to work for this. Look at my data. You know, and I, I can compare this to my uh, thermocouple that I've attached, and my temperature from the thermal camera doesn't agree at all, so this is not going to work for us. And I'm like, oh. And so there's this this gap of, of, of knowledge, you know, um, and it's like I always say it, it, it's like the the stages of, of uh, you know knowledge where you're like you don't know what you don't know is the, the dangerous one, mm. you know what I mean? Like it's like if you know what you don't know, then you can ask for help and, and consider somebody. If you don't know what you don't know, then you're going into, getting into trouble. You know? but there's a lot of help out there. FLIR has yeah. the infrared training center where you can take formal training classes. We have application engineers that can come on site for a fee. You have application engineers that can come on site for a fee, and provide consultation or training. Right. We have a knowledge base on our website. Um, you know, tons and tons of articles. Yeah. Folks a video library. Video library, around, you know. Uh, trying to spread the word and education around this technology. Uh, right. There was an ITC trainer who was very insistent to remind everyone that infrared cameras do not measure temperature. They sense radiation. Right. They'll calculate a temperature based upon a calibration that occurs. And there are some variables, we didn't talk about them. Ross alludes to them, like EMOC, we can reflect, you know, reflect the temperature and atmospheric and all those kind of things that we just don't have time to get into today. I want it to be a five hour podcast. So yeah, I know. But that's why, <laughs> that's why we're saying, please just take the time to call. Right. Because we'll ask a series of questions that will guide you through the process to help evaluate which solution best works for you. If it can work. And if it yeah. doesn't, sometimes, yeah, it's like, hey, it's it's worth doing the on-site. Right. Let's see. Exactly. Yeah, we're really here to make sure, even if you have selected a camera, to, to just uh, steer you in the right direction. Ask some critical questions just to make sure it's it's uh, it's really, um, you know, it's really going to work. Yeah. Because we, we hate for somebody to be disappointed and then we have to replace cameras and, and you know, it's just not a good situation to be in. So, you know, a couple, a couple of conversations go a very, very long way. Yeah. But before we wrap up, Ross, I was just thinking, why don't, could, could you tell our listeners a little bit about your team? Because you have a team, you're representing, you're the manager of this team, but could, could you talk a little bit about what yeah, you so, so these days I lead a team of six sales engineers that are spread so strategically across the U.S. We've divided up into more or less equal chunks. And their job is to stay very close to our key customers and support them, like military test ranges and national labs and large companies, all the, the tech companies in the Bay Area that you know about that are all using our cameras for R&D. Uh, and then to field customer emails and phone calls and advise on if infrared is appropriate for a certain task. And if it looks like IR can solve the problem and we make sure that the budget expectations are reasonable, we drive out on site or fly to them, take a whole cart full of gear, usually four or five cases, a couple different cameras and a lens kit and a tripod. And we set up for a couple hours, take some data and see if it looks like we can solve the problem. Right. And most of the time, uh, we're, we're careful because we don't want to waste anyone's time. So we spend time before going there to make sure that it's feasible and plausible. We show up, we take some great data. We usually leave a copy of the data with them so they can spread it around internally and get buy-in from the various stakeholders that this makes sense. They buy the camera and then frequently we swing back by and, and help them uh, be successful with it. Thank you, Ross. And, and, and we've worked with that team. They, we've had that team here as well. And we've worked together. We've been on demonstrations together. And uh, I, I 
Anyways, I'm glad that you, uh, you know, anyways, I wanted you to share a little bit about your team because they're probably one of the, the, the most capable and educated and, and, and knowledgeable team uh, around this technology and utilizing it for applications that are new and, and, uh, and require a little investigation. One of the unique things about my team is everyone on the team either has an engineering degree, a science degree, a math or a physics degree, mm. or worked in camera R&D for a number of years before joining the team. We're, we're not, I guess, typical salespeople, just a business background. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're very STEM heavy as far as our backgrounds. I'm a little partial to the team because actually I've had the opportunity to work with the team for many <laughs> years. And it, it again, once, once it's in your blood, this thermal imaging, this infrared, it's hard to shake it. And like you said, when the when the eyes you know widen and uh, like the lights click on uh, you know with, with a customer uh, because you're able to help solve the problem. That's that's it. Really recharges you. It does. Yeah. Being being on the road can be hard, right? And this travel is difficult. Yeah. Uh, but moments like that really recharge you. Yeah, I would have to say that I don't know. It just seemed like uh, working with prospects and customers in this space was always a pleasure. Though I mean, it was just very good customers. Well, Very good prospects. We're we're all engineers. We're all big nerds. We love technology. <laughs> and we have tons this of toys. True. Tons of tech toys at home that we're playing with, right? And right. To be able to do it for a living is a pleasure. Yeah. Right. I mean, so, really, solving problems is is, is the pleasure in, in the whole thing, right? And that's yeah. that's really the thing where we all differentiate ourselves from. You know, we're not there to push products. We're there to solve problems and make somebody's life easier, or or you know, solve something expensive or some losses or or help design the better product or whatever it may be. Right. So that's really what gives us the satisfaction to do what we do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Any any final words to our audience, Ross, before we wrap up? It's really never been easier to get into infrared. Yeah. We've got lots of experts willing to talk to you and give you free advice to get started. And we can sell you systems and you can put it together yourself. You can work with Marcus and his team and make it super easy for you. Um, you know, there's ways to get trained. Uh, so all the tools are there. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Any any parting comments? Yeah, I'm I'm just amazed by how <laughs> time flies because no, you yeah. know thinking back how long we've known each other and what we have all gone through and all the wonderful projects we have been able to see and then I always say uh, we get to work on technology that that sometimes people learn two years from now right because we always yeah. are often on the R and D stage and we have to sign all of these non disclosure <laughs> agreements. Like ninety seven, ninety eight percent of our projects are under NDA non disclosure agreements. So we can't really go into details and often we can't <laughs> even mention the customers and all those kind of things. And we, we are respectful of that. And and uh, but it, it is so but that kills you because you want to use the images for marketing so bad. Right, and you yeah, can't. that's that's <laughs> one that's one massive drawback. But it's so exciting. And that's what you said. Like it's like it, it. Even after twenty plus years, it's like still the next project is like, oh wow, this is like exactly. you know, the cool stuff. Let's let's look at that. You know, yeah. so it's a, the excitement never wears off. So that's yeah. really, and I think many of our engineers feel the same way because it's it's really really neat technology. For sure. I agree. Yeah. yeah, you know, just one final thought that I had was uh, our, our our motto or part of our vision here at Multitherm is making hindsight irrelevant. And it's all about helping individuals, customers, professionals, avoid having to go through the pain, right? right? To have to look back and say, oh, I only knew then what I know now. And I think this this concept or idea of just picking up the phone and, and making the call to get that consultation, to talk to someone, definitely aligns with that vision of making hindsight a level. So yeah. please, yeah, give Ross or a member of his team uh, some outreach or any of us here at MobiTherm, we're, we're happy more than happy to talk about this right. technology. We're and probably more excited than the customer calling. Yeah. <laughs> Most likely, right? And, and if you can provide a photo or an, an image or a cartoon drawing of what your setup looks like, it'll make the conversation go really well. Oh, yeah. It makes it a lot yeah. easier. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, Marcus. Yeah. Thank you, Ross, thank you. Uh, yeah, for fun. joining us. And, and thank you to all our listeners who joined us in this episode that we talked about thermal imaging technology and how it can be utilized in not only an R&D failure analysis, but auto also automation phase. Right. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please subscribe to our, our podcast on your, on your favorite platform. And I'm thinking if you have any questions, come to the MobiTherm website or the Teledyne Clear site. Um, yeah, we have, it, more. we have it also posted then later on the, on the YouTube channel for MobiTherm as well. So if you want to see us <laughs> talking and what we're talking about, you can, you can check it out on our YouTube channel as well. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.
Well done, guys.